your mic. Can we just give it up for Milani for yeah. the fabulous outfit? <laughs> because you just look so fabulous. I love it. Um, so this, um, uh, we got some pretty explicit rules from Milani. I am not moderating this discussion. This is just a discussion amongst badass women um, doing badass things. So we're going to just start this off with all of us just talking about, we, and, and just so you guys know, we were um, in a green room. Uh, it, it seems like we've known each other for years. We were talking about all our woes yeah. and yeah. how crazy it is to be an entrepreneur and really giving some behind the scenes and talking about, you know, just stripping all of the levels of glamour and grandeur that people think. Um, is an illusion about entrepreneurship. So I guess I think we should just start it off with talking about the creative economy and how it reflects what we do and our positions in it. I think well, before we came out here, we were talking about this question when we got here earlier today, and we were all kind of saying, what does that mean to yeah. you? And, and it's different to every person. And when I think of the creative economy, my brain immediately thinks of kind of a, a sliding scale of people on every end of that economy from the people who are working with us at, at our companies, mm -hmm. the people who are distributing, the people who are doing sales, the people who are doing publicity, the people who are doing like every level of what it takes to make a creative business. And I think so often the only person who gets the kind of credit is the person who's the face of the business. But there are so many people behind it that go into that economy. No, I agree with you 100%. So with Steadfast, I mean, I'm working with a ton of small businesses that range from home accessories to fashion, fashion design to pet accessories, stationery. I mean, you name it, it's like, it's awesome. And then you go into the event side of things where you're working with someone who might not be actually producing a soft good. By soft good, I mean actual like product. But you're working with someone that provides a service that's creative related. So someone who's doing... Um, a workshop or a book launch or film screening, it's quite fascinating to see how the creative, creative economy is not just uh, limited to one specific area, it's so broad. And then you have, you know, with my social media, if it's Steadfast, Steadfast Applied DC, everyone, but <laughs> social media, we have like our photographer that comes in about twice a month who shoots the product so that we can use it for not only through online but also printed materials. And she is part of that creative economy. So I think overall, it's just, just overall so fascinating in general. I think one of the things that's also really important to remember is that in order to be a part of the creative economy, you're providing your imagination. And your imagination is adding value to something. So one of the most important things to think about and to remember when we're talking about the creative economy is knowing your value and your self-worth. That way you're constantly able to continue uh, being productive in the creative economy and to continue it moving forward. Otherwise, you're not getting paid and you're not able to, to support yourself or your creativity. And I think that's such a good point because I think sometimes people look at the word creative or creativity and it's one of those sort of amorphous words. It's mm -hmm. like, what is it that you do? I think my parents still ask me to this day, like, <laughs> well, what is it that you do? But before I started my agency, I was a television producer. So I've always thought of myself as a creative, whether I was writing scripts mm -hmm. for you know, MTV or I was producing fashion editorials for Lucky, it was, I was a creative. I was using my imagination. Yes. And I think that people look at how do you put, you know, in this economy, how do you put a dollar sign on creativity? And how do you, you know, how do you bill for those things? And we were talking earlier, it's like, well, this is your thought process. This is your mind. And how do you put a dollar sign on, you know, on your mind and some of the things that you're doing? And I think, you know, what you said, Virginia, about the people around you, all of those folks are creatives. You know, when you are look at as a creative you know people say right brain left brain right brain all the creatives left brain you know you're an accountant you know you're the legally you're all Analytics, of these people right. and it's like they know exactly how to do you know their billing well I charge five hundred dollars per hour I do this mm -hmm. but as a creative sometimes we figure we I mean I don't know if that's something that you guys grapple with I know when pricing out bids and things I'm like you know, it scales, it, it, you know, sometimes it's this or sometimes it's that, but it depends on how much of my thought process is needed. So, for example, with Donata, which is fashion, accessories, and 
graduating from college, which, by the way, I went to school for fine arts, they don't teach, teach you the business side of things. They don't. They teach you more so on the creative side. So once I graduated, the only person, the only way I was able to learn the business side was Google, YouTube. You know? <laughs> the <laughs> DIY economy. The DIY mentality. It's just kind of just going, just teaching myself. That is how I was able to kind of build the business side, to educate myself on, on the business side of things. Plus, also, I generally love math, and I've always been business savvy and very frugal, or not cheap, but frugal. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm always figuring out ways on how I can go ahead and make a living. When I went to school for fine arts, I wanted to graduate as an artist, like become an artist. Then I graduated as an artist, was in shows, and I realized, you know what, the starving artist lifestyle is not for me. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I had to just adjust and I think that with the, being an entrepreneur, that you're constantly adjusting and adjusting and adjusting. It's never just one, you know, one level playing field. It's always you're always going to get uh, curveballs thrown at you constantly. And I think that as a fine artist, and I trans transitioned into a designer, figured out how to make an income, um, doing something that's still creative, but being able to make a living off of it, and then obviously my experience from that, being able to share my experience doing steadfast and working with a lot of brands who are entering into the retail scene. One of the things, I want to roll it back just a little bit and, and see what you all think about. The issue, I, when I think of creative economy, the thing I immediately run into is some of the problems that we face with putting a dollar sign on things, which I think everything should have a dollar sign on it and is worth something and we're all worth something. But I have noticed that different members of our community and different skill sets in the creative community are valued very differently. Absolutely. And that's something I think our community doesn't dive into often enough is when we have big photo shoots for a magazine, why are the people who provide the flowers expected to donate them? Why are the people who have food expected to donate that? But we value photography or we value the event planner to put it together. And there seems to be these contradictions within our creative community sometime of why are certain creatives valued more than others? Do you all grapple oh with this gosh. in your businesses? Oh, I, we just had a conversation with, um, yeah, a couple years ago we had a conversation with a celebrity client who paid their makeup artist uh, this, and we were doing the communications, and we were paid this. And I was like, I don't understand. Well, we're doing all of this to get you here. How are we being paid a fraction? Because it, it comes down to perception. It comes down to value. And I think, again, from the artistry level of being a creative, you know, people look at the marketing manager, the publicist, you know, the social media person, the makeup artist, the hairstylist, all of those things go into, in my, in my industry, it goes into building a brand. And I don't think that we've all figured out yet, you know, what that sort of scaling piece is. And Deanna, you talked a little bit about like, how do you scale? And sometimes as creatives, we are trying to figure out how to scale ourselves. I think the other thing that is one of the hardest things for me to deal with is that this is what I was put on this earth to do. Mm -hmm. You know, this, my passion and my purpose have met through District of Clothing and Deanna Dorsey Design. And this is, I breathe this. I, I feel it every single day. And it's hard to put a, a, a monetary value to that. Um, and it's never one plus one equals two. Yeah. It's like how I was feeling, if I slept, if I messed up at the podium, if I, you know, how I felt about my outfit, if I got something to sleep, to eat, you know, there's just a million different things that affect you creatively. And it's hard to put a, a value on that. Um, I think oftentimes, even now, I've been in this game for eight and a half, nine years, working on my own, and it's, I, I'm still constantly like, on the back end, like, oh, I should have added this, or I should have considered this, or I forgot to consider this. Um, one of the great things to me is, is my network, um, all of the people who helped me and, and my team, and then friends as well, and then also having allies. Allies are you know, people who can advocate for you. That's one of the, the biggest things that I think that we often t tend to um, not think about when we're thinking about our team. They may not necessarily be someone on your team, but it's just definitely someone who's willing to advocate for you. And also just someone there to remind you, you know, you're great at this, you've been doing this for X amount of time. Yes, it might take you two minutes to come up with something, but it's going to be a $2 million result for X, Y, and Z. And those are things that you have to put into your, um, 
into your mindset when you're thinking about how to add value and continuing to add value to the work that you're producing? Well, I, one thing is, is that when I, I remember when I was, I'm in my late 30s, 38 to be exact, but. <laughs> <laughs> we call that snuggled in your 30s. Yes. <laughs> an elder, you're an elder millennial. That's what I, I we're elder millennials. But when I was in my early 20s or in my 20s in general, I hustled. I worked hard and a lot of times I did not have the expectations of getting paid. I was just at that time, I didn't have the responsibility of my son, a family, et cetera. And so I had the time to go ahead and invest it. And if it didn't mean like, it was more so investing in my portfolio and building up my, my resume, if you like to say, so that when those opportunities that were paid were approached, then I would be prepared to take those opportunities on. I never expected to be like, well, I deserve this, 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 this. And I deserve this opportunity and this opportunity and this opportunity when I was young. Because at the time, you know, for me, it was all about creating those opportunities through that DIY mentality. At the time when I started off doing Donata, there was hardly any outdoor markets or anything going on. Crafty Bastards had just started. It was the first year. But at that time, I was hustling out there creating events. I had small like pop-up events before pop-up was big. Um, but I had pop-up events in my apartment. I remember I actually took, <laughs> I was supposed to take care of this apartment and like show it, it was empty and I was showing it to like, you know, prospective people who would want to rent it out. The guy didn't know, the landlord didn't know, but I had a pop-up in there. I had an event <laughs> one night. I think he found out later. But, <laughs> but it was all that mentality of like, you know what? I'm not gonna wait for someone to do it. I'm gonna go ahead and create it. But now I'm in my 30s and I do have these opportunities to jury crafty bastards or to move forward with steadfast supply, et cetera. Those are obviously I expect to get paid because I put in the hard work. I have bruises, not literal bruises, but I have bruises and like I've, I've got punched so many times. Again, not literal, but <laughs> I mean, I, I can tell, I can go through this whole list, this whole hour and be like, this is what happened. But you know what? You know, I did it. It made me stronger. And now I know that I deserve to get paid for how much I get paid now. Yeah. I think there's a tricky balance between knowing that you deserve to get paid, but having that time in your life where you're like, I'm probably not going to get paid what I feel like I'm worth, or I'm hustling, or building a portfolio, and then also reaching an age and a place in life where you are able to advocate for yourself and for other people to be paid and to be paid fairly, but to not judge either end of that equation, yeah. because I'm someone who speaks publicly a lot about the importance of being paid and not showing up to do unpaid work, and if you notice that other people aren't being paid to not participate in that thing, but then I hear from a lot of younger people who were like, well, how else am I going to get my foot in the door? And how can you judge me for like needing to do whatever I need to get in the door? And right. I think both of those ends of the spectrum are very valid parts of our community and they can be tricky to navigate sometimes. But I like what you said around like being in your 20s. I think we all at some point have to figure out where is the time that we're building the case study? And I know when I was, you know, blazing the trail, creating an agency that didn't really exist, you know, like with multimedia, who, you know, I was like, who has a multimedia communications agency that I could look at? And there was no one out there. I had to look at three different companies to see what they were doing to figure out, okay, this might be the trajectory or this might. And my chief, my former chief of staff came up with something that you said, Diana. She said, it's a friend tour advisory board. Mm. So they're your friends and mentors and supporters that will tell you, no, that idea is not the best thing. Mm -hmm. Or yes, maybe you should, you know, do something for two weeks. I know I got my foot in the door at MTV because I was a production assistant, a non-paid production assistant for two weeks. But I knew that there was a light at the end of the tunnel. Right. I said, if I work on this pilot for two weeks, for no, they had no money. If the show got picked up, then I could be the associate producer of the show, which is what happened. But I knew... That I had, and at that time, I was married. I had one child. I couldn't afford to take jobs for free. But I also think that there is this thing, if you believe in the vision, mm -hmm. if you believe in who you are, what you do, and what you're going to do, it helps, it, I mean, it, it helps to be a catalyst for those mm -hmm. things of, okay, what is my case study going to be? Yeah. And, and then you, I think you, it's dating before you marry. You all have to, you know, like, some of us actually had a child first and then I got married. But <laughs> that's another talk. But um, I, I think it is giving yourself the room to say, yeah, because I deal with so many young people and they're like, well, I, 
and and I so I battle with it. Yeah. They're like, I'm worth all of this, and I do this, and I should be making this, but you didn't do the work yet. Yeah. Like, do uh, the yeah. do the yeah. work first and build the case study because then I'm like. Do you know I was doing this with a child and making no money? We were eating tuna fish and oatmeal, but I knew at the end of the tunnel it would result in, okay, I built this, I built this, I built this, and then I could get, you know, the bigger clients. It's all I mean, we all have to scale at some point, and I do think it does start with that hard work of like let me hustle on well, hustle. And the transparency that you just had right there is what makes that possible because we were, Dion and I were talking about this before. I think what's missing from these conversations so often, especially in this kind of bright pink myth of female entrepreneurship and girl bosses and all this stuff, and I'm a part of that messaging as well, but like we are only putting forward the like bright pink pretty picture at the yeah. end of that rainbow and not all of the crap that happens beforehand and then all the crap that happens after you've had a success because that's the other huge yeah. myth is like once that you get to a certain perceived note perceived, perceived place of, of success <laughs> yeah. everyone thinks you're rolling in it that you're great and the same week that I was telling Deanna before like I've started this magazine and I am I'm making no money off of it and I needed to hire somebody to help me. And I had literally no money. So I went around my house and I sold a bunch of furniture. Yeah, <laughs> and I love it. I'm 14 years into my business. I thought I would have a savings account by now, but I do not. And that is the reality of working in a very up and down community. And I had this girl on the internet talking about something and then she was like, oh, well, why would I listen to you, rich bitch? And I was like, yeah, I just sold all my knew. tables. <laughs> like, no, I'm not rich. <laughs> That is reality. And similar to Grace, I mean, I did the same thing. They weren't my tables. I happened. I went downstairs. I live in an apartment building, and people throw away really nice things all the time. So I was going downstairs and picking up the really nice things and selling them on let go. And I hear that. That's smart. It's so smart. You know, it's a thing. It's uh, you. You can sell things on let go that are yours or that are not yours, and you can. You can maybe go out to dinner or pay a little bit more on your taxes. I mean, I think this is the most refreshing talk that I've had in such a long day. I feel like we said earlier, like we've known each other for, for years now because we've been so open and vulnerable with one another. This is not easy. Um, entrepreneurship is not sexy. You're never Instagram ready. You're, you know, like. <laughs> you did not wake up like this. You did not wake up like this. You know, we did not show up looking like this. We still have quite a bit of work to do just to prepare for tomorrow, similar to all of you all. But I think um, in today's world where we're all just dealing with so much on a day-to-day -day basis, I think we owe it to each other to be a lot more honest and vulnerable. I think that's one of the best ways that will help continuing women to move forward in this industry um, is to just to be honest and say, like, this is hard. You need a team of people who people see, and then you also need a team of people who people don't see, and you need people to hold your hand, people to wipe your tears, people to, pay your, to help you pay your taxes, people to help, you know, attorneys who you can pay and attorneys who you can call, and I can't afford you right now, but can you at least answer this question? You, just, you need people to um, hold your hand and to help you go throughout the process. So thank you first to um, National Museum of Women in the Arts for having us, but thank you all today for just holding my hand. You know, it's it's... It's, I'm, I'm grateful. Oh. I'm grateful. We're all, we all feel the same way. I mean, that's, this is, we were all talking beforehand. None of this, none of us happen without helping each other, without advocating for each other, without standing up for each other in difficult times. And I think that transparency has to come with compassion. Yes. Because I think for some people, they, they do have money and they have venture capital funds. They have parents who pay for things. And I don't want to judge that person any more than I judge the person who doesn't have any money. Right. And I think that so often it's just, when we talk about these things, they get narrowed down into the prettiest version of something. And especially when we're all coming from such aesthetic fields, you want the prettiest version of something. And it sounds better to say you started this and then you struggled and it was great, end of story. But I interviewed 107 women for that book and I can tell you every single one of them, no matter what point in their career they were, were still struggling yeah. in some way. And they all were like, tiptoeing into that question like well it could be a little bit tough and maybe and I was like well let me tell you what this person said and they had and then and then it would all spill out yeah. and I think sometimes we all just need that person to like pick up the thread a little bit and then we feel more comfortable to open up about the things that aren't so easy yeah and, and I think because we're in this sort of era of social media you know it didn't happen if you didn't share it and you know, I, I was watching this sort of Twitter conversation between Kanye and the head of Twitter, 
and the head of Snapchat. And, you know, talking about how we come into society where we measure your success by, you know, your likes. And I liked the authenticity of the conversation where, you know, Kanye was saying, you know, we shouldn't be measured by our likes. And being measured by your likes is like putting your salary out there. Um, and then also some other things he said that I can't repeat in this <laughs> establishment. But he said it was like, you know, putting your naked self out there. Yeah. And someone had said, oh, there should be a T-shirt around, you know, just authenticity and who you are. And I mean, there were, there were a lot of great things. Diana, you should follow that thread because you might be able to come up with a great T-shirt. But um, I'm sure and I'll see yes. it in another two weeks. Um, but I, I think that because we're in a space where we're fostered with authenticity and we're you know, we are around one another and we were having this great dialogue. But I also wonder when we're in our real world mm -hmm. feeling super vulnerable, where we're pit up against clients or we're pit up against competitors or even our team, how do you manage the authenticity mm -hmm. and the honesty and the storytelling with being, you know, at the level of vulnerability that we are today with, you know, great people? I, you know, it's, this is, this is, I'm so happy that we're having this conversation. I think um, I'm, I'm just very mindful of protecting my creativity. I'm very mindful of me. Um, I'm very introverted, as you all could probably not tell by now, but um, <laughs> I need my alone time. I like to be on the couch. I like to watch TV. I like to read. I like to listen to music. I love to sleep. I love to be outside. And I need to make sure um, that I'm constantly doing that, or one of those things at least every single day. So I wake up every morning and I pray and I meditate. If I don't pray and I meditate, then I'm not going, it's just not going to happen for me. Hopefully I can also make it to the gym, you know. So I, I just remember to make um, my to-do list, and when I make my to-do list, I put myself at the top of the to-do mm -hmm. list. I think it's one thing, you know, we often just like, oh, we have all these things to do, but you have to remember to put yourself at the top. Um, in order, once I fill up my cup, then I'm able to fill other people's cups. And um, I also noticed through District of Clothing social media that, you know, there's days when, like, I'll be really great with posting um, motivational text messages or, or conversations or just posts. And if I don't post those some days, I, I get lots of DMs like, is everything okay? What's going on? We need this. And I just realize, like, people need it too. So the more that we're open and vulnerable, the more that we remember to put ourselves on the list, the more that we're able to help and to pour into other people as well. I mean, I think that for for my account, so obviously I have Donata Design, which is more personal, then Steadfast Supply, which is more business. I, I am also an, very much an introvert. My hands are sweating like crazy, and I have my crystal in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> I <think> myself. <laughs> I'm a huge introvert. I've just learned to kind of overcome my shyness to be able to be a representation for all these small businesses that I carry at my store. So with Steadfast Supply, it's all about, I have my mission, I have my agenda, to share the stories of these wonderful brands with everyone. For those who've been at the store, awesome. For those who've not been at the store, shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> Come on by, visit us. And so it's my job role as the store owner. I'm, my goal, my job, is to represent them and to make sure that their products, their stories are shared with everyone, including on social media. So I try to be as empowering with um, positive quotes, with con being consistent with social media, by taking photos of all the brands, sharing their tidbits about their stories, tagging them, et cetera, tagging the photos with local creatives, et cetera, to really spread the word about what we're doing at Steadfast Supply. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, Donata, which is obviously knitwear, but it's become more personal, I've actually, at the beginning of this year, started to be more authentic and true and honest. And the reaction I've gotten in, re in response to this post have been amazing. Because it felt like, okay, I'm not the only one feeling this way. About two years ago, uh, I lost my mom and was going through a lot. And I posted and shared about it, something very personal. And actually, at the beginning of this year, I did this spiritual uh, hike called El Camino um, mm. out in uh, France okay. and Spain. And these are the shoes that I actually, I wear these shoes all the time as a reminder of that spiritual journey. And I shared my journey on Donata. And just being able to be a little bit more transparent, I don't share everything, obviously, because I think that would be too much. But I share some about 
if, if you go on my Instagram stories, some days I don't have a good day. You know, I do experience depression, anxiety, and whatnot. And I do wake up super early to work out, but not for vanity. It's really just to maintain my, my anxiety level. Mm -hmm. And I know that other business owners, other women out there, other mothers experience the same thing. And I just want to share with them that it's okay. It's okay. And you can do it. If I'm doing it, you can do it in your way, but you can do it. And I think it's important as leaders in these fields, different parts of the creative community, to share that so that other people will know that they're not alone in this race towards achieving their dreams. Well, that was great. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. Can I add one thing? Yes. I'm sorry. I just wanted to add one quick thing. I think that when we talk about transparency, there's sometimes this expect, there's like people feel this pressure to be mm -hmm. transparent. And I think that it's totally fine if people aren't transparent. Absolutely. I think it's bad yeah. to be fake and don't make up things. Right. But I think like you don't owe anybody anything. No. Mm -hmm. Like people will write you and say, like, you owe me this. It's not true. Don't, don't listen to followers or people who tell you that you owe them deep personal details. It's not true. They're not there to pick you up when you have to deal with the fallout from that. And I think sometimes social media is this like dangerous lure of like, this give us slope. everything mm -hmm. because we love that. But no, it also opens the door to everyone having an opinion on every single part of your personal life, which unless you are really used to dealing with that is a really crippling thing to manage. Um, but I have personally found that transparency on the internet is actually a protective thing for me in this like weird opposite way of, I think if you only put your best foot forward, you inherently just slower and slower put yourself on a pedestal in this way that people, it becomes so tempting to knock you off of that as quickly as possible. Even like for people in our community who aren't like Kanye's, but like have a decent following of people, like you can feel that pedestal and you can feel yourself going up because you only share the things that go well. You only share your volunteership, you only share whatever. And then everyone's like, oh, you're so amazing. And I'm like, no, 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 you have to balance that out. And I think that's where transparency, like I feel like it's this invisible thing that I try to feel where I'm like, ooh, I've shared a little too many things that like went well this year and I've got to share the things that I did that were horrible. Yeah. And I spent a lot of time on my Instagram stories apologizing for being a jerk on social media. And like this literally made <laughs> like, that was horrible. I'm so sorry. And I think it's important to like balance those things out because if people don't know you are a real human being and that you can own those moments when something really bad does actually happen, which is a part of business life, they don't know that they can trust you to make it right. Yeah, it's true. And I think sometimes putting the things that aren't so great out there shows people like, oh yeah, they, they know how to own that and move forward and learn from it. So And that's such a part of our creativity, you know, yes. being able to deal with the highs and the lows and, and yeah. being able to exist in, and to create effectively in, in between. Yeah. 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 And I think that thread of, you know, transparency, you know, one of the things we talk to our clients about is if you're gonna tell a story let that story be an honest story. It doesn't mean that every day you have to tell everybody you had avocado, you know, avocado <laughs> toast and you did this and you did that. But it means that if you're going to tell a story and you've just made it to the, you know, some of the celebrity clients that we work with, if you're going to be on the cover of Vogue, tell people it took you 15 years to get there. Exactly. It doesn't necessarily have to be that you break down everything and share everything because there is a level to that that, you know, we talk to clients, if you share it, Remember, it is saved and someone's going to follow up. And again, I'm, I'm speaking from the standpoint of, you know, some of our celebrity clients and some of the corporate clients that we work with. It's a simple rule of if you're going to share a story, try to make it as authentic as possible. Try to give the glory behind the story, because here's the thing. People are looking at you as a model, as a blueprint as a way to say that this person has blazed a trail, how can I do this sort of in my own respective, um, you know, in my own respective industry or in my own space? Mm -hmm. And one of the follow-up questions that I wanted to just quick ask because we were talking about finances. Mm -hmm. um, when <laughs> finance. Everyone gets that big little smile. Like, yeah. 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 It's got uh, some tables I can sell. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, and it, it's whole, I mean, it's definitely levels to it. And um, do you think you know, being, you know, because we're talking about the creative economy, do you think, you know, creating your own and creating your own lane and the creative economy helps to get us to the financial freedom that we want to be? 
And financial freedom is different for everybody. Exactly. Exactly. That's the conversation I always want to have is like, what does that look like to everybody? Because people who live in different parts of the country like have different ideas of what financial freedom is. And if you want to live in New York City or DC or Philly or any other big city, like you have to make a lot more money and it puts a lot more pressure on your business. And I mean, I literally moved out of New York City because I was like, I will never make enough money to own a home here. I just won't. Like neither myself nor my wife will are work in fields where we will it will be realistic for us to have two million dollars to buy an apartment. That will never happen. Um, but it didn't make me upset to know that that wouldn't happen. I don't really care. But I wanted to have a home and I wanted to have a yard and a thing that was mine that I could <laughs> transform. And to do that, we had to move to a tiny town in the middle of nowhere. And that's kind of a cost. But the quality of life increased. And to me, that was a form of success that was far more important than increasing my salary. And it meant the business had to change a little bit, but I was okay with that. So I feel like success and financial freedom sometimes means undoing the narrative you've told yourself of what that looks like. Like, I'll do this, then I'll get this raise, then I'll get this. And it just, sometimes that path is a left turn and not a straight climb up the ladder. Yeah, I guess, you know, everyone's metrics of success are so very different. Um, For me personally, it's, I I think growing up, I was was taught that money, I I wasn't taught that money grew on trees, but I was always taught that if you worked hard, money grew on trees. I guess that makes sense. (laughs) And so as I I said earlier that I feel like, um, I love my parents and they've done a great job raising me, but I feel like they've kind of left me, (laughs) I'm not prepared to adult, right? So it's kind of like, hey, you know, there's just so many things that um, we learn, but there's also so many things that we don't learn, and there's so many things that we have to unlearn. And so with Deanna Dorsey Design, I think my one of my metrics of success is making sure that I'm able to pay my bills, making sure that I'm able to pay my taxes, and hopefully having a little bit of money extra at the end of the month. With District of Clothing, it's hearing that someone um, was inspired by a message or hearing that someone decided to sign up and, and register to vote. Or maybe it's someone decided to come up with their own business. Or maybe it, it, there's just so many different um, metrics of success that I have for different avenues of life. Um, and learning how to be able to um, cope with both of those is one of the hardest things that I'm learning how to do now while I'm managing both of them at the same time. I mean, I grew up, so my parents were amazing and provided me with so many different opportunities. Uh, I'm first generation American, so they immigrated here. My dad built his business. He's a doctor from scratch. Um, has his own uh, um, has his office and everything out in Western Maryland. So I saw that level of hard work that he had to invest into providing me with a really good education. Um, so for me, it was always been about that being financially independent. My mom would just always say, work really hard. She always gave me uh, so many inspirational quotes that I share on Instagram a lot, but it was all about being financially independent. So for me, my goal is to be financially independent where if something ever happens with my husband, who I adore very much, I'm able to support my family. I'm able to support myself, and I'm able to support my son. That's what it means to me. Yeah, I like that. I just want to shout you out for having a business that is able to offer health insurance, oh, a four hundred one k. These are these are forms of success too. Like to be able to offer that to other people and not just yourself is a really big, big deal. It's a well, very big deal. Mm-hmm. Like, well, thank you. Yes. Well thank done. You. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it took a long it took a long time to get there. I again, story behind the glory. So when I started Sky Blue Media, before I started Sky Blue Media, you know, I was late off. I was a TV producer, then a magazine producer. Found out I was pregnant with my second child and said, you know, I want a normal job. So I got a job at a public relations agency and thought, you know, I'm going to be working these fun hours from 8.30 to 4.30. I'm going to be normal. And normal didn't do it for me. I found myself crying all of the time. And then I went back into TV and I was laid off. And when you're laid off, that's why I said I was eating tuna fish and peanut butter and jelly. I was not lying. We were on a strict budget. My husband was in graduate school. And when I started Sky Blue Media, it was like, I've already failed enough. Like, what else can I lose at this point? We're already eating Quaker Oats. Um, Bumblebee tuna has become our best friend. Yeah. We've made it 20 different ways for dinner, yeah. you know, between the, the, the cheese that goes with it, sticking it in the oven, making it a grilled tuna melt. Like, that was everything. So I knew that if I didn't want to be treated like that, you know, with someone having a child, 
being able to like buy groceries. I said, when I started my own company, I wanted people to eat the way that they wanted to eat. If they had to go to, to the doctor, if they were you know, bicycling to work, if they were ever hurt, that they would be protected. And I think it was a decision to make sure you know, we were offering and paying 75% of health insurance and, and, and glasses and all of those things. Mm -hmm because of the way that I was treated as an employee. And I don't think that all, you know, not everybody understands how other people are treated. I think it's a, it's a thing of empathy, um, but my company will be 10 years in January. And it took us 10 years to get yeah. to the point of offering all of those benefits to employees. So yeah. that's financial freedom, is that if I am able to take care of myself, I wanna make sure that the people around me are also taken care of, and it's not like, I'm making 25 times the amount that they are, but we are, you know, again, it's equity. That's why I like the word equity mm -hmm. instead of equality, because it is about offering access to people. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, you know, we didn't, we didn't touch on this, but as a black woman, yes. you know, as a black woman, yes, as a black woman, mm -hmm. as a black woman, I have not had the access mm -hmm. that my, you know, my white women mm -hmm. friends had, that my white male friends have. So I know how hard it is to say like, hey, I have to buy groceries. Like, you know, I was making $85,000 as a producer. He was making, you know, $125,000 as, you know, as a production assistant. And I'm like, well, I had more of a brain trust, but he, because he was who he was, made more. So I think that if we, as women, have the power of influence, maybe it's through our voice, maybe it's through, you know, the things that we open up for other businesses, I believe now is the biggest time for us to offer it up to other people yeah. and to yes. make sure that we're pulling up other people and not taking things for ourselves and fine. saying, I, you know, I'm successful, not because, and I, and I will say it, I am successful. I give myself two snaps in a circle all of the time. Rakeem, you are successful. Yes. You did the damn thing. If you have three human beings walk out of your body and you have a... <laughs> you have a business that's almost 10 years old, you are successful. I look in the mirror and say that all of the time. And as a successful woman, I have to bring people around me and up with me like in order for them to be successful. Right. And they then have to instill the success in others and it keeps going. And that's the only yep. way that we'll create real equity, real wealth within our communities and the industries that we work within. Right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I think you hit it right on the mark. It's it's lifting as you climb. It's advocating for mm -hmm. yourself, advocating for others, and then building yourself a network of allies who will do the same. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just to touch base, thank you for saying that because, you know, having Steadfast and being uh, a little bit over a year doing it as a brick and mortar shop and having teammates part of my team, all women, by the way, it's been a huge challenge. Like my whole goal is like developing that company culture and really figuring out ways on how to empower my team and provide them with opportunities for growth. Because like you said, as I'm growing, I don't want them not to grow with me. The whole goal is for them to grow with me. So we have monthly reviews that we go ahead and sit down a lot. I've Someone commented and was like, monthly reviews is a little bit too much, don't you think? For me personally, I think it's a wonderful opportunity to have a sit-down conversation with your teammate and like have an a honest, you know, professional conversation on how they're doing, but also how I'm doing as a boss. This is relatively new to me to be in a managerial director position. And so therefore, my whole goal is to figure out, because every woman, th though, like, are, though fantastic, they're our brains are very complex, I mean, come on. So my whole goal is to really understand and figure out ways on how I can make the work environment at the store a great one so that as we scale, they feel like they can grow with the team itself. So we've already, our team is small, it's only five uh, women. But so far, two of our teammates since working, um, and again, there's a lot of turnover in retail, so they already been promoted. My whole goal is to, again, just provide those opportunities. Yeah, I like that. I want to check in with, you said boss. I want to check in with our boss, Milani. Um, are we good? Okay. 10 minutes? Oh, okay, cool. Awesome. Okay, so we have 10 minutes. 
Um, and then we're going to open it up for questions. Okay. Awesome. Perfect. Did you Great. have a question? No, no, I'm good. Oh, okay. I thought you wanted to interject. Um, well, we were sharing. We were we were sharing some nitty gritty stories. Um, you know, I love that you talked about having to sell furniture. I love that you talked about having to sell other people's furniture. <laughs> <laughs> But what are some other challenges? And I think it's it's good for us to remain, you know, super authentic um, in this room. What are some other challenges that women entrepreneurs, specifically in the creative economy, um, what will they face as you know in getting into entrepreneurship? Or what are some of the challenges that you think that we face just in the creative economy in general? I mean two main ones that I think. Uh, the first one is obviously the lack of like pay equity. Um, I mean, I, there are so many layers of that that are intersectional that between women, between, I mean, whatever identity you have, I, the way that I found out how differently people are paid has been so problematic. And I fight as much as I can to make sure that that doesn't happen or to pull out of things if people aren't being paid. But I think one of the biggest issues we face is just a complete lack of of equity when it comes to pay. And I think that's something that we all have to like ask more about and pick more at and better understand and support each other in. And I think women in particular face that. I mean, I know my male counterparts who have been blogging for the exact same amount of time that I have are all making at least 10 times as much as I'm making wow. and get the sort of deals that we just can't. And I get told on a daily basis that I am difficult because I ask for money that I know I am worth, and I ask for money that I know my male counterparts are making. And brands will come to us and say, like, hey, we need you to do this for this amount. And I'll say, hey, I know what you're paying so-and-so, and so I need to be in that ballpark. And they'll be like, we didn't expect you to be so difficult, which is code for woman. Oh, yeah. And so that is really problematic, um, which is just an, a daily thing. Um, but the other thing is kind of, it's difficult because I think it sometimes falls into a stereotype that I try not to play into, but for me it has been true, which is I find I, I put myself in this position, but also find myself being taken advantage of because I am a compassionate woman who understands what it is to be a human being, and it's not the way I was ever treated by a male boss, ever, um, which probably made the business more profitable, but I felt very unsupported. and. I try to be the type of boss that does take people's personal lives into account and difficult times, I and mean, there have been tough times, but that sometimes means you get taken advantage of, and it can be really complicated. And I was telling you before we, we met, I had to let somebody go on my team who was a man and then said to me, oh, I really expected more from you. And I said, oh, what does that mean? Because I thought there, the polite firing was going very well. And was <laughs> 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 it, 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 it compassionate, whatever that going to phrase. Um, I, I felt like it was going well. And he said, I expected more from you. And I said, what, what do you mean? Could you clarify? And he said, well, I expected more from a woman. And mm -hmm. I said, well, what does that mean? And he was like, well, you're supposed to be more compassionate. And I was like, well, you've been doing a terrible job and I'm losing money. Like, how, I am compassionate letting you go and like giving you pay and trying to be as nice as I can possibly be. And I went home and I cried and I felt terrible. And then I realized like, wait a minute. Yeah. I just wrote a recommendation for him to go to a new job and I gave him a month's pay. Like this should not be happening. Right. But, and I talked to my other friends who are women who run businesses and we've all run into that feeling of like, crap, how do you draw that line between wanting to be compassionate. I don't want to be the jerky male bosses that I had earlier in my life. Um, I know it's not only women and not only men. I know it's not that simple, but it's something that I run into a lot with women who run businesses is we often kind of want to be more compassionate and that can be tricky. Yeah. That's, that's a good one because I remember early on, I would, you know, in the vein of transparency, one of the tough lessons that I learned was be transparent with the folks that are around you, but also learn when to fog up your glass. Yes. Yeah. So you can't be completely transparent because I got myself into a ton of trouble with employees and sharing all of this information and, oh yeah, let me tell you about my woes and my hiccups and all of these things. And same, I, follow, I fired, I was telling them this story of bringing uh, you know, my whole team into a room and saying, you know, Sky Blue Media is going to the 12th floor. You know, some of you will get off on the third floor. Some of you will make it to the fifth floor. Right. But we're about to go to the ninth floor, and I'm going to have to push most of you out on the eighth floor. And they were like, what, does that mean we're fired? Like, what does that mean? I was like, well, I'm going to do a one-on-one -on -one with everybody. We did reviews. And I will tell you, within the next two months, 
70% of you will not be here because it, there was a time in my company where I needed to hit a refresh. I needed to hit mm -hmm. the refresh button. Things weren't gelling. There was too much conflict. We were losing clients and there was, and I just couldn't figure it out. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I said that it, one, it was, I hadn't built enough human capital and I hadn't built the right human right. capital. And that one employee said, oh, remember that thing you told us? Like, you know, six months ago, he took that and went to a huge publication and turned it, you know, turned it against me, but he didn't know as an entrepreneur, you know, I majored in crisis communication. So I started off anticipating the worst. So as a crisis communications person, you always anticipate the worst. These are the things that are going to happen. So when he tried to go to this publication to do a huge feature about me, his expose on me, it turned into like a two sentence, you know, a two sentence thing where the publisher of the magazine said, we know that you have an angry, you know, employee. And that taught me then not, I mean, the folks that you work with, they are not your friends. No. They are not, and I learned it the hard way. I thought we were a team. We spent most of our time together. You spend more time with the people that you work with than your own family if you're you know, putting the work in at the very beginning. And it was, these people are not your friends. You work with them. You can have a love relationship with the people you work with, but essentially the hard lesson that I learned was learn when to fog up your glass. Yeah, no, I've learned that too. <laughs> I mean, not, not extreme, like as in your case, but I've learned that stepping into a role of, of a boss, you're then no one's friend at your work. Mm -hmm. You can go ahead and be friendly and obviously have a very professional relationship, but I never, which I've been asked, you know, let's go happy hour. I never go. Yeah. I define that line. I respect their privacy. I don't go onto their Instagram or anything. Oh, like I'm that. already blocked from all their Instagram. <laughs> Because I tried it. I'm like, can I view your stories? And as soon as they see my face pop yeah. up, they're like, you're blocked. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Actually, one of my employees, she uh, shared with me, she was like, just to let you know, I blocked Steadfast Supply. Like, so I can't, really? I don't, well, the stories, you know, you can block this, you can hide the story yeah. portion of it. You know, it's privacy, and I respect that. I like that you respect it. I'm no I respect that. it. Oh <laughs> but thank you. I, I respect it. I'm learning uh -huh. something today. Ricky of Boundaries, you can't look at IG stories. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of learned to kind of kind of um, build that level of thick skin. So if, if I hear something or someone says something, I don't take it. A lot of times, I don't take it personally. I just kind of bring it up in the next review. <laughs> <laughs> Plain and simple. <laughs> Another challenge that I've experienced, and I know that you and I talked about it a little bit, is just also, as an entrepreneur, as a woman, also being a mother. And I'm sure that many of you guys in the audience probably experience it as well, the challenges of also being a mom to, to one, to three, <laughs> and also running a business, and the need to scale it and to grow your business. I find it many times challenging because for me as a mom, I feel like I have most, I experience mom guilt a lot, like a lot. And I take up a lot of the responsibilities, even though my husband's fantastic and I adore him and he's a great father, I take up most of the responsibility. That's my choice, yes, I know, but I know that I want certain things to be done a certain way, so hence I take up those responsibilities. <laughs> but it's, it's really hard to like, you know, I work Monday through Saturday, and to like not be able to enjoy the weekend. But I also look at it at the, at the bigger picture of what I'm trying to achieve. So therefore, I try to resolve that mom guilt by taking more vacations. So I've taken probably with my family three to four big vacations every year where we take a week to a week and a half off and we just spend quality time together. That's awesome. I think, you know, it's, it's really, uh, on the flip side, I think when you don't have children and you don't have family, or excuse me, you, you don't have a children but you still have family, you also still have experience guilt. Mm -hmm. So I remember when I finally hit the five year mark um, with Deanna Dorsey Design, I, threw, I love karaoke, and I hadn't seen my friends in essentially five years. So I threw a five year anniversary slash like thank you for still being my friend party. Oh, I love um, that. And we all, you know, had a couple of drinks and, and sang karaoke all night, and it, it sort of made up for me not being there for the last five years. So it's just really important that you have, like you said, 
loving people, a, a circle of people who are there to support you at all times, and then also people who are compassionate and understand what it is that you're trying to build, even if they don't see it every step of the way, they're still supportive. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Can I just add one more thing to that? I, I think we're all, like everyone, we're all in agreement that it's so important to have that supportive, entrepreneurial, like, girl backup group that like helps you get through things. But I also wanna say, I think it's really important to have people who have no idea what you do in your life. And I've only done that the last few years and it has been the most fundamentally helpful and life-changing thing I've ever done is to have people in my life who don't, don't know what a blog is, yeah. who knows, like, do not, <laughs> yeah. and wouldn't and care. And they don't care. Yeah. And wouldn't care. Yeah. And it, it's been so life-changing on every possible level, but I feel like a human again. I, don't, I think it's like this, thing of like, oh, become your brand. I did a whole radio show on becoming your brand. And I look at it and I'm like, that's gross, Grace. What were you thinking? Yeah. <laughs> and you shouldn't, you shouldn't be your brand. You're a human first yeah. and a company second and or third or fourth or fifth or wherever it is in your priorities. But I think unless you have people in your life who remind you like you're not just yeah. whatever the thing it is, it's, right. it's so powerful and so positive to have somebody in your life who will remind you of the parts of yourself that have value that have nothing to do with the financial value of your company. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say that's the only way, like people are always like, Raki, you have three kids, how does that work? Because I have a husband who's a total left brain. He is a complete square. That <laughs> he, he is a complete square. And when we met, it was like, I was exciting. I introduced him to sushi and Thai food and things <laughs> like that. And he does not care. You know, he's like, what is marketing? What yeah. does that mean? What is a press, press release? What is social media? I mean, he knows who we work with, but he doesn't have any clue of what I do. So we can have real normal conversations. And he's the person that's like, I, you know, the, the person that organizes everything. He's the operations person. He's like, the kids have soccer. This one has ballet. He maps out all of the calendars. And I just go with the flow. Just yeah. tell me where you need me to be. Like, yeah. you can be the boss of the household, and I can be the boss of Sky Blue Media. And we had that sort of working relationship, but it, but it does take someone that is completely opposite. If we were both creative, I, don't, I just don't, I don't, because I know myself, I'm like, I need somebody that's like, I'm a left brainer. I don't care what you do. I don't care what stage you're on. I don't care who you're sitting with. This is how things are done. And we compliment each other. And I appreciate that he does a really amazing spreadsheet. I don't know how to work Excel like that. So it's like, you do Excel, but I will Excel in the communications industry. Right. Uh, but but you, it, it's, it's that right, left brain, and it's the perfect amount of balance. I yep. think you hit the nail on the head. And our boss says, wrap it up. Oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, so we are uh, finishing our conversation, but we invite you to the conversation. <laughs> So we have about 15 minutes for questions, if you have questions. And I see someone here yeah. in the back. So how do we do the questions? Yeah. Oh, you oh, have yeah. microphones. OK. Oh. I can't roll. Well, I wear thick glasses. <laughs> Hi, my name uh, is Kafi D'Ambrosi. I am starting a company designing camera bags for women. And my question is, is um, with everything that you're mentioning, how does someone starting a new company with a new product for the market, trying to break open the market for women who look like me, who are photographers, uh, and add in some diversity. How do we focus? Because everything that you mentioned, I think about. Even though I'm trying to focus, get my prototype out, I'm also thinking about benefits, Aflac, warehouse, Aflac. EEOC, you know, management, drop shipping, all the Chinese people chasing me in the inbox on LinkedIn, like, I'm trying to figure out how do you, <laughs> you know what I mean. That's so how real, do you, yeah. How do you focus on the main thing and then focus on the outside things? Because I'm getting caught up in everything instead of focusing on the design and the engineering and the production. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Being very, 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 very disciplined yep. and organized. So I'm doing like three different projects, right? So I have a list of to-dos that repeats itself every single week, which can range from bookkeeping to weekly sales sheets to uh, sales incentives, responding. When it comes to Crafty Bastards, we have a list of to-dos that needs to be done every single week. And what I do is I assign those tasks per day. 
based upon how much time it takes to complete each task. So Monday and Tuesday, since I'm on the floor Wednesday through Saturday at Step Fast Apply, Monday and Tuesdays are my days to get through all that stuff, making sure the newsletter's out, making sure the social media is sent, or the, the context is sent to our social media team, because right now I've graduated where I've actually outsourced my social media to another group that posts and schedule and does all that wonderful stuff for me. But I have to finish it on Monday and Tuesday because on Wednesday, I know that I have to then focus on the Wednesday list of to-dos, which is working with my teammates on restocking the floor, you know, bringing, going through applications that we get on a weekly basis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if you wake up a lot of times, the reason why I wake up super early, and I wake up every day, almost every day at 4.30, minus today, which I woke up at 9.30, which is, yay, sleep in. <laughs> The reason why I do at 4.30 is because I'm giving myself more time. I know that I need that time to answer emails. Plus, it looks awesome when you send out an email to someone and they see it and they're like, you say, good morning, and they see it's like 5 a.m. It's like, yes! <laughs> you know, I'm hustling. And so, taking that time, if you don't wake up, wake up that extra hour early or two hours early and just start your day and get through that list and go from there and start tweaking, okay, how much time, and being very efficient with your time as well. Yeah. Can I just quick add, I think a lot of businesses will make a business plan. And what we tend to do is we focus so much on the business plan that you don't look at the personal plan. So I'm launching two new businesses in 2019, and in order to do that, I had to be very disciplined and very cogent in the way that I was working on those other businesses. One, I knew I couldn't do it alone, and there's power in partnerships. So I teamed up with other people taking a, a, less, a lesser equity stake in those two companies because one, I couldn't pay them what they needed to be paid because this was a, you know, an independently funded new company. Both companies are independently funded. So it's partnering up with the right people. I've also found that Basecamp has been a great tool for my additional projects because one, I know that you know, it's gonna be a set of things, that, uh, to-dos that do remind me every week but I am, I've been an ADHD child since I was diagnosed at the age of nine, so I need something else to be able to push me. And Basecamp for me has been great because it'll say, here are all of the ideas that I have, and it puts itself in some sort of like parking lot, but it'll remind me of the great ideas that I had maybe three or four weeks ago. But it gives you the set of discipline, skill set from a tech standpoint to say, here are all the things that you need to do. And it'll also follow up with you and say, what, what, what things did you accomplish this week? And it's learning about how you are. Again, if you need to be complimented by someone that's gonna be the operations side, get a great master's student, you know, a master's degree mm -hmm. student yep. who says, I wanna build a case study and I may work with you for a fraction of the, the, the price of the company because it's gonna complement your skill set. So don't go into it saying, I, I, I get a complimentary set of skill sets if you know that you need to do something and you can't execute fully by yourself. And if yes. I could just sort of tackle onto that too, I, I wholeheartedly agree with what they both said and just to sort of take it a step further from Virginia, um, it's great to be disciplined, but you also want to remain disciplined through disappointment. Remember that you're human and to give yourself grace. Um, it, it, Rome wasn't built in a day, neither will your company be. It will happen. Just keep, you know, take it day by day, step by step, and remember to breathe and to come up for air. Yeah. To further expand off what you were saying, there's power. To further go off what you were saying, there's power in partnerships. Hmm. When you're starting out as some businesses, what are ways that you're growing your team members when you don't have the capital to actually pay someone. And I know I work full time and then I come home and I do X, Y, C for my business and we work full time so that we can pay our publicists and our social media people. But for other people who are going at it, you know, mostly their own full time, how, how did you build your team? How did you build that network of people who, who you know, will come in and do, do things for free for a little while? and you know, and build that trust with them to say, hey, you know, we're not there yet, but one day we will be there and we'll be able to, you know, give this to you. I feel like I'm somebody who has always had a large team of freelancers. I've only ever had two full-time employees in 14 years. And so I figured out 
how to pay people very efficiently. And I have found the most successful way to keep people on long term and to make them happy when they're not making as much money as they could probably make somewhere else is to ask them up front what they are passionate about and what they want to do and offer them a chance to do that there. If that doesn't match, they're not the right person. But I've always found people who just want to write about this one thing or want the chance to be able to see their voice in video form or podcast form or whatever it is. And if that's the thing I can offer them, it's a way that I sort of emotionally supplement the financial side of things by saying, hey, well, I don't have that much more money, but I do have a platform where I can say, yeah, test out your own column, try this thing out. And then I foster that and accept that if I can't financially keep someone past a certain amount of time, I feel proud that I have supported them and then going to leave and start their own thing in a few years and knowing that I maybe should have paid them a little bit more but couldn't, yeah. but we each got something out of that situation. So ask them up front, what do you want to do? What makes you happy? Like, what have you been longing to do? And then if you can offer that, that really does offset the cost sometimes. And I built my company with interns. And my oldest employee has been with the company for seven years and she started off as an intern. So, you know, and people always say, you know, millennials, it's a revolving door. They never stay at a company. And I will say, knock on wood at some point, that the folks that I started off with are the folks that are here with me now. And they were the interns, they were the co-op students. And it was asking them, and I can shout out Kristana Siabatoni, she it has been with me maybe eight years, almost eight years now, but it was asking her in the beginning, what do you want to do? Who do you want to work with? And I had an agency and she's like, well, I don't like working with this client. I don't, and, and sometimes that's difficult, you know, to have to try to satisfy the needs of others. But I knew that if I could satisfy the needs of others before satisfying my needs, I would build a team that trusted me that said, okay, if we asked for IKEA, hey, you know, they had, I mean, the reason they have health insurance and all of those things is because they had great sessions with our chief of staff and said, we want this, we want this, we want this. And it felt uncomfortable to me when they came to me because it was like, I can't do this yet. But I said to them, as soon as we get to this level and it's promising people, hey, I can't pay you right now, but listen, if we can do this together, as soon as we get there, that's when I'm gonna pay you. And maybe in another company, market value, you would have started off with the title of coordinator. But here, you're going to start off with the title of executive. Yeah. So it's also some people just working with them on, and, and, and I will tell you, people like titles more than they like money. They really uh, and do. They really, they really like do. titles. Yeah. You know, a lot, a lot of folks were like, I want to be a creative director. And it's like, it well, is. guess what? That's an entry level position. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. <laughs> Come on down. Yeah. And, it, and it was that, you know, just making people feel comfortable. And I think confidence goes a long way. If people are confident in their ability to work, maybe, again, maybe you aren't offering the most amount of money, but they feel like, and I, I have an employee who is someone who says, I, and this is what he said, I identify sometimes as a man and I identify sometimes as a woman. And someone, and sometimes, someone asked him, why have you worked at Sky Blue Media for such a long time? And he said, because I always got to be myself. That's it. I always got to be myself. It wasn't because he made a lot of money, because he could go to any other company. It, it was because when you walk through someone's door, and maybe your door is, you can be who you want to be. You can, you can dream who you want to be. If you come in here and say, you're the executive of innovation. You're the executive of innovation at your studio. So it's, again, allowing people to be comfortable and be confident and exploring on their own. Uh, first, thank you for your amazing stories. Uh, I have two questions actually. So we are talking about creativity and I am someone who struggles every day to be creative in my work. And I really want to go back to the definition of creativity. You talk about imagination. And I was wondering what is the, the source of the imagination of your creativity? Because you have amazing stories and, and amazing activity so I was wondering what's the source of this creativity and my second question is about we talk about what um, what are the the, the, the ingredients to make uh, a successful entrepreneur you talk about the network and all these important ingredients but I've, I was wondering about the skills so what are the soft skills that we need actually to be successful and 
in particular for women, because we know that women are different. So what are the soft skills that are really important for women entrepreneurs to be successful? Thank you. Do you want to go down the line? Or how do you yeah, let's go down the line. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the first part was the thing uh, that inspires our creativity. I would say for me, it's problem solving. I don't consider myself an artist or anything. I don't think that's a bad thing, but I'm not an artist. Um, I was an art major, and I was told never to be an artist at the end of my, my senior high <laughs> <laughs> um, So I think I found my niche. I am so motivated by problem solving. I, I want to, whether I'm the problem or I find the problem, I want to solve the problem with whatever skills I have. And if, it, if I'm not the person who can solve it, I am so motivated by being able to connect the people who have the solution with the people who have the problem. And that always spurs every project I've ever done. Um, I think in terms of soft skills, I think for me the biggest thing that's been, the reason I'm still existing as a business is agility and right. flexibility. I think more than any other skill I've learned over the year, whether it's team management or budget or whatever, at the end of the day, every business changes constantly. The internet is changing every second of the day. That affects all of our businesses. And I think if you can't roll with the punches and accept that maybe what worked for you for a year doesn't work for you the next year and not take that personally, that agility and flexibility will serve you for decades because none of us are running the same company we ran two years ago or five years ago or 10 years ago. So flexibility. Yeah. I think uh, from the imagination standpoint, there's a book out right now called Imagine It Forward by Beth Comstock. You should all get it. Um, she's a mentor and it's a phenomenal book that talks about imagination and moving things forward and how do you create creativity within yourselves. But I would say my source for imagination is always the possibility. Because when you are creating something, you don't know whether, you know, as an entrepreneur, you're gonna jump off of a bridge, whether you're gonna land in a, you know, a pile of rocks or you're gonna land in water and you're gonna have to tread that water. So for me, it's the idea of going to bed every night that I could get up and create some sort of possibility. That possibility might be a new story for the next day. That possibility may be a new company or that someone really got the idea that I was trying to pitch. It could just be a possibility. And I think in terms of soft skills, I think that confidence is a big thing. You know, people get into rooms and they fill up chairs. They fill up chairs, and I've seen you know, men get into rooms and they fill up the entire chair. And I listen to them because they fill up the entire chair. So I think that if you look at, I'm a words person, so I love to understand and dissect words. If you look at the word confidence, it is the ability to tackle a task. So you've all tackled tasks. You've done something that you've tackled, whether it was getting the right parking spot, whether it was you know, eating someone's nasty food. It's a task that you've tackled. So I think that if you can look at confidence as a skill set and confidence as a soft skill, I think that every entrepreneur needs to master a set of confidence. And just knowing that their confidence is a little different from the confidence to the, the person to the left of them or to the right of them. But it's just understanding it is your ability to tackle a task. For me, when it comes to creativity and how I get my creativity, that kind of that uh, being energized, et cetera, I mentioned it in be before. Is I tr we travel a lot. We travel to new places that we've never been to. Uh, for example, Japan, we can go to Mexico, we can go to Europe, and we just keep our eyes open. A lot of times we try to avoid taking the metro or any sort of transportation when we're in the city. We tend to walk. because so I want to see what's around me and be inspired. Very, very visual. Um, that's the artist in me. And so we tend to go to, if I go to Paris, I'm going to concept shops, I'm going to art shows, I'm doing all of that because I want to see what other people are doing. You only get so much from looking on the web mm -hmm. and through Pinterest, which I love Pinterest, but it's really great to be able to walk through an art museum. If you go through an installation and you're able to touch it, to touch it versus just to see it. I've been into different installations where my favorite of all time was in Bilbao. And it was this room just filled with fog. And you can you go in there by yourself, and literally Kelly, my husband, would walk away from me, and all of a sudden he just disappeared. And it was just silent. And I was like, wow, that's awesome. Those are things that I like. <laughs> Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness.
because I'm red now. <laughs> Don't tell my husband. I love you, Kelly. Okay. So, <laughs> when it comes to like the business of what it takes to be an entrepreneurship, I obviously agree with both of you. Um, I do believe that your business changes constantly, and you're constantly thrown different curveballs. So you have to be ready to adjust. I'll tell you honestly, my store at the yards, I, a month ago I got noticed, I, got, I have this really great agreement with them, but we're built to be modular, so we move and we pick up and we go to any space that's available at the yards. So Boston's different. And I have to move on Sunday. I have to literally move my 3,000 square foot shop into another space. And I gotta do it before we open up. We close Monday and Tuesday, I gotta do it within those two days so I don't lose out. I'm not going to, I'm not going to bitch and scream and cry. No, I'm gonna be like, okay, great. Like, I love working with the developer. They've been very supportive with me. I'm gonna be like, okay, this is part of the agreement. Let's do this. Let's, let's go forward, let's figure out a plan, how we're gonna, a strategy, how we're gonna go ahead and move, et cetera. So I think that if you wanna become like a great entrepreneur, you really have to be passionate, disciplined, really be uh, able to just quickly adjust and move forward. You may spend, and I did spend like, you know, maybe like an hour crying, maybe drinking wine too. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't waste time. I got to keep on moving forward. So and I, want, I want you to fill your store with fog. You really have to be resilient. Yeah. That's yes. number one. Yeah. yeah. I was raised to um, provide a service and also to be mm -hmm. of service. So I think the one thing that feeds my creativity the most is hope that my, the reason why I'm here is going to, to provide a service to people who are in need of whatever that service may be. Um, I specifically remember when I first found that I was a creative person. I think I was like eight or nine years old. I used to have a lot of hair and my mom would take like, take her four hours to do my hair. So she had to lay me on one side for two hours and then lay me on the other side for two hours. And so we would either watch like a basketball game or football game or whatever happened to be on, but we always watched great movies. And I just remember seeing Audrey Hepburn cascade down these steps and I like shot up. I remember I got burned on the side of my head <laughs> and I was just like, whoa, who is that? Why am I feeling this way? Why? Like I just was completely enamored by Audrey Hepburn. And whenever I'm starting a new project, I try to always remember that feeling like, whoa, you know, it just like awoke something in me. And I hope that, um, my work provides that sort of feeling for other people as well. And I wholeheartedly agree with what everyone else said on the panel. I think um, when your passion meets your purpose, you're unstoppable, but you also have to learn how to pivot. And you have to learn how to evolve, and you have to, um, you have to you know, cry, whatever it is you need to do, but you also have to be able to put your boots back on and keep it moving. Um, and I think one of the best things, like I have several different mantras, but one of them is you know, keep it simple, keep it moving. And um, I, I think just remembering to pivot, you know, it's okay to cry, come up for air, go back down, and just keep it moving. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.